I think it's like any great invention. You want to keep that thing hidden. He probably knew what he was getting into and knew that this was going to be something everybody was going to be doing. It, it was going to become a, a household item, how it's going to take basically the whole industry. They recognized that and stole it. Stole it. Stole it. Stole it. So this is it, Sneva MFG. Um, this is kind of divided into three shops. So this is finishing handwork over here. Um, that's our graphics press. It's heat, time, and pressure, and it takes the liquid ink and turns it into a gas, and it infuses into the plastic. So pretty cool. It's a weird, there's a weird science to it. Um, but. Uh, in high school at Lewis and Clark, we both had the same wood shop class. TJ was one of those kids. There was always a few kids that were better than the others, you know, that really, you could tell that it was something that they were passionate about. And TJ was one of those guys for sure. He would tune up skis, you know, for all his friends and friends' parents. Most of the people in his family were all super mechanically inclined. So I think it just kind of just fell off the branch there and it hit him too. So my grandpa was a big racer here in Spokane and, and he had five boys and they all raced cars around here. So my dad was IndyCar racer for five years. My uncle Tom was the more famous Neva. He won the Indy 583. My family wanted me to stay out of racing altogether. Just because my dad saw how hard it was to make money at it, you know. Even though he did get to the big stage, it was still really hard to make money doing it. And, and potential to get hurt um, is great. Coming up the second turn, Tom Sneva run, got into the outside wall. The car has come to stop just in front of us. There was some flame. The engine's torn completely off of the car. He was stunned, flipping around in the car. And then my uncle kind of got me skiing when I was four or five years old, up at 49, and I just grew up skiing around here. Super spoiled in this area with all these awesome resorts, and nobody knows about them, so. I think it gets in your blood a little, you just love it. I like to ski pretty pretty wide open, and, and big turns, and smooth turns, and that's kind of what racing's all about. High school kind of moved on to Schweitzer a little bit more, just a little more challenging. And We'd go up to Schweitz, to Red Mountain, and we'd ski up there. You had to be only 18 to drink, so we'd go up there and party and stuff when we were seniors. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> I've grown, I've grown from those days. <laughs> he was that guy that, you know, would dye his hair, in high school, you know, get the nose piercings. And I always respected him for standing by his guns and, and not really caring what other people thought. So I met TJ Sneva probably about 12 or 13 years ago. We started collaborating on some kind of innovative things and some things I wanted to do with, with ski building. And I kind of knew his background with building skis. In you know, like the late 80s, early 90s, as nobody was doing switch tricks, right? So, but this was right when snowboarding was really blowing up. So snowboarding hit the scene like 88 and started taking over the Pacific Northwest, really the whole world. In like that 91, 92 time, everybody's on a snowboard. Skiing was still like straight skis. Shape skis hadn't even come out yet, and twin tip skis had definitely not come out yet. But it didn't take snowboards very long to realize that. Snowboards were being made twin tip. People were doing switch tricks, riding regular, riding goofy, hitting jumps, fakie, 
landing fakey. Hitting rails, landing backwards was big, you know, doing more than just a 360, doing 540s, 720s. So we were starting to do the tricks, the cool tricks that the snowboarders were doing. We were trying to emulate on our skis and we just really didn't have the equipment for that. You know, and all our friends were snowboarders, dude. Me and TJ were like the outcast skiers, you know. The, the vibe back then was, you know, skiers were kind of lame and snowboarding was cool. And to be honest, I saw it as like, Something has to be done or, or skiing's gonna go away. Towering tall in Oregon's Cascade Range, 55 miles east of Portland, is fabulous Mount Hood, two miles high. It's great country for skiers if they can get up there. You know, I was a snowcat operator at Mount Hood. Mount Hood was kind of a, a crazy place. So we left 10 days after we graduated, packed all our shit up. And... First meeting TJ and Greg, that was probably we ended up with the A-frame cabin that had a big basement, living in the foothills of Mount Hood, and uh, instantly thought they were cool guys, and we were on the same wavelength and doing the same lifestyle. But they're riding with snowboarders, so they're starting to do tricks like snowboarders, and everybody wants these twin-tip skis. Everybody wants skis they can land shit backwards on. Ski backwards, land jumps back, you know, do all these tricks, and so he probably knew what he was getting into and knew that this was going to be something everybody was going to be doing it eventually. My buddy's like, well, you need to figure out how to do it. And I'm like, I have no idea how to make snow skis. We'd stay up at night talking about it. I'm just, just like, yeah, dude, come on, guy. You're wood shop master, you know. You're a Sneva, dude. <laughs> He called, he called the guy that ran Creed Snowboards, said, hey, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, but if you want to come to the shop, we'll help you make, make the first pair and get it going. And so we did, we went to San Diego. and They took this big road trip and went to check out the snowboard factory. And while these guys were closed for the night, they let TJ come in and build a pair of skis. You know, the guy at Creed was like, well, you have to make it in this mold. I'm not going to change the mold for you. In this, like basically a snowboard mold, right? Like a twin tip snowboard mold. So he had a 153 in the press, which is pretty small for skis. But I was like, well, let's let's make one and just see, proof the concept, you know, and see if it works. And, and then we just used a snowboard to make the side cut. And that's, that's kind of how, we kind of accidentally made a shape ski in the process. But yeah, the first skis, they actually worked really well, but they weren't nearly what we were wanting. And there was like a little rope toe snowboard competition going on. And I was really nervous. I wanted to go try it out by myself. So I didn't fail in front of a bunch of people, but there was a couple hundred people there. And, you know, made some turns, first lap, second lap, a couple fives, you know, got some cheers and felt pretty cool. I was like, hey, we might be onto something here, you know, it was, it was really fun and, and, uh, yeah, that's kind of how we got the momentum to go build my first press. So he'd drive the cat in the, at night and he would press his skis during the day. And he would press the skis in the basement of his house. You know, he'd be uh, gluing maple and poplar strips together to uh, design the stiffness of the core. And after he made a couple pairs, like we would go out and him and Greg would be ripping it up. Yeah, I have 540s, fakie fives, fakie seven, stuff like that. I mean, that's about as far as I, I mean, maybe did a 900 a handful of times. It took me a minute to get the first 540, but that was a celebration. They went off backwards, you know, I mean, because nobody's doing that shit, you know. You know, we're flying shit, man, 100 feet, you know, probably in the air and, and you know, looking down like 30 feet down, you know, just holding this tuck and nice smooth landings and none of my snowboard buddies could get over it. There's, there's nothing better than fucking tearing down the hill and you, you look, you know, you just glance over and your bro's just fucking right there with you, just. We were really uncool as skiers at first and kind of brought it back, you know what I mean? It was like, yeah, check out what we can do, you know what I mean? Skiing on, the, on his skis was a blast. It was the first time I'd gone skiing since my accident and so it was kind of monumental for me to be able to go out there and have him and and ride his skis to do it like the next year after we made our first you know 10 pairs we went to the SIA show which is a big trade show in Denver um, it was actually in Vegas then all the other companies had super nice booths and ours was just we just had like a tapestry 
like a, a sheet that everyone had like with spray painting on and just you know new harvest anarchy. I think Glenn Plake was a big skier at the time. He's a dude he used to have a big mohawk. And I heard at one point TJ ran up to him and slapped a sticker on the side of his bald head. So they were just kind of running around having a crazy time. It sounded like something I wish I'd have been to. Some of the bigger companies would come by, take a look at it, talking to TJ a little bit. It was cool to see that he was the only one there with him. He had spoke to one of K2's um, skiers. He was the one that I think TJ had the conversation with. And K2, after the show, had called and had us come up to Vashon. And we were, he was, you know, he was pretty excited that that there may be some sort of partnership or something happening there. The first day we were there, we spent all day, got a factory tour. I showed him what we were doing and some quick videos of what we had been doing, really sloppy, but and at the end of the day, they had contracts laid out for us. And, and, uh, and so I was like, let me be smart and drive back to Spokane and show my lawyer, you know, I don't know what any of this means, but I'm like 98% sure I'm gonna do it. And then came home, lawyer said, yeah, you'd be dumb not to, you know, it's going to be hard to make your own and get set up like I am now. And he's right. But uh, so I went back to K2 the next day. And when we got there, they had us waiting, waiting, waiting forever in the, you know, in the lobby. And when we got into this little meeting, this little room, the guy basically just started telling us about their twin tip ski. And they said, we've been working on this for years. and. We don't need you and you know i was mad at the time but i'm well over it now you know no big deal but uh yeah i was upset i felt like i was taking advantage of a little but that's life i guess so you know they could have told them that they had already been developing it in this nap they didn't have it at the trade show nobody else had been talking about it and so for them to come up with some kind of story that it, they already had something in the works. I think it's just a complete farce. All right, I'm ready to ride for you guys. And they just like, ah, oh, we don't know what you're talking about. This, you know, we've been we've we've been developing this idea for years. We don't need you. So basically, they they saw the the potential there and they cut him out of the deal. And then um, I believe it was the next season or two that they came out with their initial or first pair of twin tip skis. It taught me something in the in the whole process because we were trying to apply for some general patents. Um, but you gotta have money to protect a patent. Just steal his idea because he's a little guy, you know, probably 20, 19, 20 years old, and just doesn't have the backing that those guys did. They recognized that and stole it, as far as I'm concerned, you know, because nobody else was doing it, nobody else was even thinking about it. People ask him about this story all the time, about if he's if he's mad about, you know, this the shot at fame that maybe that maybe missed you a little bit. But I think TJ's attitude is always to move forward. And this is this guy that's continually, every single day is making, trying to make his products better than everybody else. So we're making about 850 to 1,000 pair a year um, with snowboards and snow skates involved. He's made a great name for himself. It's his own thing. He can make all the decisions and continue doing what he, what he loves to do, which is build skis and ski. I see somebody on my skis almost every run. And feels pretty good, especially when you talk to them and they're like, oh man, these skis rip and they're having a good time or yeah, that's that's probably the main reason why I'm in it. You know, I love it when I see people having a good time on something I built. My daughter Winter, she's always out here helping. She's got a couple pairs of skis. Um, I have two daughters now, so either of them form an interest in this and you know, love to hand it to them. You know, I felt like we were at the, the forefront and the pioneer of the thing, but the kids quickly took it over and, and elevated it so much higher, you know, um, which is rad. That's what it's all about. That's the cool thing about skiing is anybody can do it. You know, anybody can get out there and have fun with their buddies and, and go rip. 